It is time. Deviant said we had to start. Yep. Hey, Adrian. De Deviant said we have to start now. Are you guys ready? Oh, damn it. <laughs> Hope I didn't say anything that I'll regret later. All right, so uh, thank you for coming out to our talk. So you want to compute post-apocalypse, rebuilding the internet at the end of the world. And uh, we're going to say right up front, I hope that AMC doesn't sue us for borrowing some images. Uh, so those of you who are fans of The Walking Dead, so are we. Okay, so let's get right into it. We've got a lot to, to cover over the next 60 minutes, and we've got about a slide a minute. So we're going to move pretty quick, try to keep up. Woo! Yeah, will you get the references from Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Okay. All right, so a little bit about us. Hi, my name is Larry Pesci. And I'm Darren. And together, we are... No, don't do it. Wild Stallions! No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he didn't want to do that. All right, so uh, we're what both security consultants with uh, NWN Corporation. We do penetration testing, vulnerability assessment, all sorts of uh, that good fun stuff. Uh, in a previous life, we used to do rack and stack networking uh, in all sorts of different environments. Uh, we're members of the Paul.com Security Weekly crew, uh, and we're both ham licensed ham radio operators. Uh, Darren with his tech at KB1 Wool, and myself with uh, Extra at KB1 TNF. And uh, Darren and I have known each other since college, and we're longtime co-conspirators. Uh, for those of you who have been to ShmooCon may recognize the uh, uh, little Jeep over there on the side as a piece of artillery for uh, ShmooBall launchers. So we've been working on projects together for quite a long time. Okay, so a little bit about why we might be considered experts at this kind of stuff. Um, so we're pros at internet uptime testing. Fortunately, my boss is in the room, so we do a lot of work. Yeah, we do lots of work making sure the internet's up. It's administrative time. Yes, it goes on our time cards as administrative tasks, yeah. We surf the internet, internet uptime testing, okay? Um, we love all sorts of gadgets, um, and we consider ourselves amateur preppers. Yeah, we're getting started. Uh, we're making sure that we've got some things prepared for various scenarios, and we're gonna blow a little bit of OPSEC. Yeah, I know, bad, right? But we're here to help you guys uh, come up with some various stuff that uh, hopefully will, will help you guys to compute post-apocalypse. Okay, um, based on that, the security community has made us kind of paranoid about wanting to use the internet. Um, and, and after the fact, and, and this is sort of why we're going down the, the prepping route. Uh, and we also run a website called Survival Nerds, and it's a techie's approach to survival post-apocalypse. So applying the hacker mentality to survival. All right, so you wanna compute end of the world, right? So we need to talk about what could make up the end of the world, and what type of scenarios are we planning? So we're, don't really, doesn't really matter which one of these you believe is going to happen. We're going to attempt to cover the one that is sort of all encompassing, taking all of the other possibilities um, into effect. And we'll, we'll talk about some of our favorites. Okay? All right, so the first one. First one is the act of the flying together box. We, 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 wanted, we didn't want to offend any particular religion, so we picked the most humorous. So we just signed up in the ball. <laughs> um, so, obviously this would be acts, acts as a flying spaghetti monster, uh, earthquakes, hurricanes, bad things you can't avoid, um, solar flares from the sun. Next up, a personal favorite, okay, zombies. Which we hope uh, to see lots of tomorrow. Yep, hope to see lots of tomorrow. Go get your face uh, done up and uh, donate some money to Hackers for Charity, okay, if that's still happening. Good, so great zombies, maybe not necessarily realistic, but lots of fun to think about and gives you some really good things to think about from a survival perspective. What happens if you need to move because you're being surrounded by, well, maybe not zombies, maybe zombies, but other folks that want to take something from you. Maybe not your brains, but maybe your internet. Okay? So it gives you some thoughts about uh, maintaining some lightweight infrastructure and those types of things. And what we seem to do is, uh possibility of financial collapse as we uh, just print money like if there's no tomorrow, if there's really nothing backing it, we're just printing it because we can. Yeah, not intended to be a political statement, right. uh, but it's a possibility. The next one is. Uh, this one's a political that statement. possibly lead them to government failure. If there's no government, there's no rules. 
Okay, and the one that we sort of see as being most encompassing, um, that requires the most uh, need for doing the prepping uh, and, and preparation for rebuilding the internet is EMP. Because if you don't prepare for EMP now, uh, after it happens, it's too late. Okay, so the uh, the concept of taking a uh, nuclear uh, device, detonating it in the atmosphere, and here's a uh, statistical uh, model for a, uh, a fairly decent sized blast uh, detonated at just about 300 miles up. Um, the resulting EMP shockwave uh, is alleged to take out just about everything over out of North, North America. So if, if once the EMP happens, it's instantaneous. Uh, if the EMP goes off, anything that is connected to longer than 18 inch length of wire and some sensitive electronics no longer works. So you need to start thinking about doing this now. Great, we can do this stuff and, and plan for uh, mobile sort of uh, internet environments and, and you name it, but if we don't plan for EMP when it hap if and when it happens, uh, it's already too late. So we're sort of going to go down the EMP route because it can take into all the other portions for uh, financial governmental collapse, um, acts of FSM, uh, and zombies. Okay. And really what the end goal here is too, so the most important thing, yeah, a lot of these things you guys might be looking at, you guys are all crazy, that none of that stuff's ever going to happen. <laughs> um, no, but the flying spaghetti monster stuff really could. So, you know, at the end of the day, we really want to look at being prepared as a way of saying um, we don't need emergency services because they may not show up, and they have more, they can find more money to do than, uh, than take care of us. Um, and you've seen we've seen that with uh, Katrina, um, a lot of law enforcement just decided this isn't worth it anymore. I'm out of here, um, and that's gonna. I mean, we've seen it. It's that, that's what's gonna happen in any natural disaster. People are just gonna say, you know what, this isn't worth it. I'm out of here. So. Yeah, so the, in, the intent for uh, our instruction to you guys is, is not necessarily to go and have a year's worth of food and you know, plan to, to be on your own, but at least as some initial steps uh, to, to provide the opportunity for you guys to not necessarily need to be reliant on, on emergency services and potentially take that into the future. And plus you then, if you're also prepared, you might be in, in a position to help out your neighbors. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, hey, we're computer hackers. Right and penetration testers. So let's take our perspective on on some of this survival stuff. Okay. So we want to make sure we introduce uh, a few tenets of preparedness. Uh, the first being one is uh, two is one, one is none. So in a disaster scenario, how many of you guys are familiar with uh, two is one, one is none? Okay, a couple of you. Okay. So for those that aren't familiar, uh, think about we have uh, an EMP and you've got some devices, whether it be a blender or a gun or a wireless router and you've got them appropriately protected if you've got two of them and one breaks how many do you have left one yeah it's simple math right if you have one of them and one of them breaks how many do you have left none two is one one is none so plan that one of them is going to fail because one will break okay uh, some other ones is do more with less uh, there's going to be less for you guys to have, less for us to uh, have availability. They're not going to be making this stuff anymore, potentially. So you've got what you've got, and you need to start thinking about how we can start doing things with less. Okay. And uh, lastly, the haves versus the have-nots. Okay. Um, so great. You've done a good job. You've done some preparedness. You've got some protection. You're there to protect your family. You've got some food. What happens to those folks that don't have it? They are going to come take your stuff, okay? The haves versus the have nots. So you need to find ways to potentially protect yourself, and maybe we can use some technology to enable some of that protection, okay? All right, so a little bit more on the, the two is one, one is none, okay? Great, have more of, of the items because one can fail. So when done, one does fail, maybe you can use it for spare parts, and then you still have another one. Okay, that means potentially in some of these scenarios, two radios, two laptops, okay, two sets of antennas, because what happens when you break one, you snap it in half, no longer working, okay. You want to do this before we have some sort of disaster, because it will really suck to try to find this afterwards. And if we're talking about EMP, great, you want to find some one of these pieces of ham radio equipment, you're going to be going all over this, all over the place trying to find this stuff, and it's not going to have been protected, so it's not going to work. So, game over. 
Okay. Um, the other thing that we, we looked at when we started going down this route uh, was the, the idea of sort of community spares and com community census. Uh, so Darren and I live in Rhode Island. It's a, it's a very heavy marine community. So think about what is in the environment that you can use for spares. There are an awful lot of boats in Rhode Island. Great, deep cycle marine batteries. Something good to standardize. If you can find all the stuff that you want for deep cycle marine batteries, deep cycle marine batteries might be a great option. Okay? So think about these types of things that are in your community. If you're a member of a ham radio operators group and everybody likes Yezu, cool. Maybe you should think about buying Yezu radios because some of your friends might have spares when they no longer exist. Okay? And this stuff really doesn't always need to be expensive. Okay? Uh, Craigslist and eBay are your friends. Um, I actually just bought some equipment and uh, buying it off of Craigslist when it works, make sure it works first, uh, is an awesome option. Okay. Um, make sure we're storing our technology appropriately, think EMP. Again, options why two is one and one is none, because what if you're using one and you have one stored and protected appropriately and the EMP goes off? You've now just taken your two to one instantly. Okay. And make sure you take the stuff out and test it regularly. All right. So how can technology save lives? Well, aside from the obvious, the beans, bullets, and band-aids, right? Food, protection, and, and medical care, okay? How can we start using some of this technology to potentially save lives or, or protect our families, okay? How about short distance communications, okay? You, you wanna take the internet past the end of the block? Well, first we need to make sure that no one's coming at the end of the block. So you set up a, a, a station down at the end of the block with someone monitoring with a radio that can communicate wirelessly back to you to say, hey, we've got inbound, okay? Short range communication. Uh, how about potentially long distance communications uh, on the border of your town? Hey, we've got this large uh, convoy rolling through. Maybe we want to think about evacuating. Uh, maybe we need to batten down the hatches. So a little bit longer distance, okay? Uh, think about some other things. So now it's not only gonna be just the haves potentially versus the have nots, but also uh, government and military agencies. And what did they standardize for radio technology? P25, okay, uh, which was demonstrated not that long ago using the pink IME pagers uh, to be able to disrupt P25 communications. Great, go get yourselves some pink pagers, program them with the P25 uh, denial of service condition stuff, find ways to power them inexpensively, and when the shit hits the fan, go drop these in your environment so when the feds show up at your place, they can't talk to each other. That might be helpful, okay? Okay, uh, and some other things that we may want to consider for some of these communications. Data, data exchange, um, how about transferring electronic texts on, on medical information and so forth. Then a little bit about protecting the electronics in the event of uh, a VMP or something like that. Uh, there's a lot, you see a lot of stuff on the internet that you need like this crazy copper mesh system that's grounded and all that stuff. No, you just need a, a metal cabinet. Um, and so we took this old uh, filing cabinet, this is ours, and uh, just took uh, some of that uh, truck spray bed liner, sprayed it inside to prevent contact with the, with the actual metal, yep. and that'll, that'll protect things just fine and there's plenty of room. Um, again, anything with 18 inches of wire is going to get fried if it's sensitive enough. Um, and then the other things to think about, you know, EMP may be one of the one of the more least likely things to happen, but floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, and things of that nature, you need to be prepared for that as well. This is all great and everything, but if it fills up with water, you've lost it all anyway. Yeah. So. And some potential when we start getting into some of the technology, some of the uh, the outside installations. If you've got all this stuff stored in your EMP cabinet and you need to go deploy it, well, you better stock up on weatherproof enclosures and silicone, right? And again, two is one, one is none. What happens when you use the first tube of silicone? You've now got one, okay? So stock up. Then you know, the event's gone by, now you need to power things. Uh, so you need to decide what you want to use for power. You've got, you know, a generator. What's the problem with that? It's really, really loud and requires fuel. Fuel's gonna be very, very scarce. Uh, wind, is it? You know, again, how, how windy is it where you are? Is that really feasible for you at your location? Um, and it's pretty much a big beacon. Hey, look at me, I have power over here, over here. Um, solar, no moving part, it's quiet, uh, provides the electricity. Again, if, you know, you've got to, and then you've got to be concerned with batteries. So again, in Rhode Island, knowing that we have uh, a lot of deep cycle marine batteries, it might be good to standardize on that and use the, that I would vote for uh, solar. And again, um, if you use solar, the uh, electronic charge controllers 
will get fried. Yep, they're connected. Um, so make sure you have some extras because if you don't have that, you just got some fancy looking now. Pieces of glass in the backyard. Pieces of glass in the backyard. Yeah, so they're connected to pieces of wire longer than 18 inches to your charge controller that charges your batteries full of sensitive electronics. Yeah, buy a spare one and put it in your EMP cabinet. Because this is the system that we actually have set up that drives his uh, camera radio equipment on his desk. Yep. Okay. So uh, a little bit about batteries. Okay. Um, it, when you're looking at charge controllers, think something potential flexible or uh, a potentially uh, DIY, DIY situation. Um, uh, actually looking at some plans for building a charge controller based out of a 555 timer. You know, very inexpensive parts. Cool. And we can source a whole bunch of inexpensive parts and potentially build them out uh, ourselves afterwards. Okay. Uh, potential uh, option for you post-collapse. Uh, great, you've got the ability to generate power and store it in batteries, and someone else wants to use their technology that runs on your chargeable batteries that still may be useful to them. Barter your ability to charge batteries for food and band-aids and bullets, okay? So if you're starting to go down this route, um, very easy. Um, just a quick note, um, the two sets of solar panels on the ground and the one up top, Harbor Freight Tools, $160 with a coupon, okay? Relatively inexpensive. Okay, um, take a look at your various battery types, what you're going to attempt to charge off of 12 volt, whether they be lithium ion, um, nickel metal hydride, you know, you, you name it. Make sure your uh, charge controller can do various different stuff. Okay, and uh, depending on the type of battery that you're choosing, you may want to make sure that your charge controller will handle those as well. Okay, uh, and again, think about those types of things when you go down that community consensus route uh, about what's available in your community. All right, so now we come to it. Great, why in the heck do we want to rebuild this internet thing anyways, right? So we, we potentially know why, right? We've had this disaster. We want to have some potential for us to exchange some sort of data uh, to uh, enable some c communications for us to uh, you know, be protecting our families and our friends uh, in potentially a larger area. Great. Or just porn. What's that? Or just porn. Or just porn, right. Because why else would we, yeah, never mind. All right, so um, great. We now know how we can potentially power, whether it be solar generator or wind. Uh, we'll let you guys pick based on your particular environment. Um, and, and we're going to need to sort of start small and think about how we can make this bigger. Because what's going to happen day one? You're really going to be concerned about you know, what's in your front yard and at the end of the block. You know, a month from now, you may be concerned what's on the border of your town. It, Towards six weeks, you may want to know what's coming statewide. So you know, it's a gradual sort of progression. It's not going to happen overnight um, because not only in instant are you going to be trying to set this stuff up for communication, uh, you're also going to be worried about uh, where in the heck is my next meal coming from? Okay. So there'll be lots of wires around after all this happens. That's really wonderful. I'll just tap into that and send the data down the wires that exist. The problem is. A lot of them are already converted over to fiber um, for, for the long haul. Uh, there is lots of old copper, but you got to find it. Um, and could be cut up into segments uh, as, they've, as they've replaced it with fiber. Um, but it's old, it's not maintained. And a lot of the people that did put it in and know about it are probably already gone yep. uh, at this point because. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, they're, well, older, it's just they're, they're, they're older, they may, be already, uh, may have already passed on just due to their age, uh, or they didn't survive the six weeks without food. So okay. what can we do when we don't have the wires? Yeah, so what do we do when we don't have the wires? All right, so we take ads out of the 1970s, out of the, uh, the CB radio movement. Okay, No CB operator ever looked like this. Uh, much to contrary belief. Okay, so how about use, utilizing a phone patch? Great. We can start going down that route. We can uh, use our uh, ham radio equipment to gain access to phone patch. Awesome. But the phones are dead, right? So the, the back end equipment for the phone stuff is, is non-existent. Um, maybe not necessarily a good choice uh, because the, the distance for the radios that we're probably going to be finding for the phone patch, if we can get access to it, if it's public, um, isn't going to get us very far out of our affected area and, and, and may likely not be good for us. Great, we can go set up our own, but to what expense? We're going to have the same problem with this public one. It's going to be in a relatively short area. Uh, we're going to be able to gain access to it in a service area that's affected and uh, has no phone service. So uh, a pretty hefty expense at very little return. 
So uh, maybe this isn't a, uh, a good idea. So let's abandon this whole wires thing anyways. So this is the first, one of the first images that came up when I Google image searched who needs wires. Don't ask, I have no idea. Okay. Um, so yeah, maybe we don't need wires. Uh, maybe we can rely on some of this wireless stuff. It, it, it's great to move around. We don't need to worry about finding twisted pairs every uh, time we move. Um, and, and specifically, we're sort of talking uh, ham radio. They must be doing something awesome next door. Why are you guys here? <laughs> uh, we are also talk about some uh, commodity gear, aka Wi-Fi. So that, one of the, so one of the other options, uh, one of the easiest options, is obviously to get your ham radio license. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a totally nerdy thing to do. Right. It is very nerdy thing to do. Um, it's also a very easy thing to do. There is no more uh, Morse code uh, test involved in any of the levels. If and I can do it, you guys can do it. I can do it. Oh yeah, if he can do it. <laughs> um, you get, uh, what's the guy's book? Uh, Gordo, Gordon yeah, West. Gordon West uh, book, uh, it just literally gives you the pool of questions that the questions come from. Memorize them, go take the test, and it's, and it's easy. I did it um, in a week to get my uh, first level license. Okay, so uh, great. Um, the only thing that, some warnings here. Um, you know, talk about blowing your OPSEC. Hey, you've got a ham radio license. You're required to identify yourself as part of the rules set forth by the FCC. Uh, in order to get your license, the FCC requires that you have a valid mailing address and that you keep it up to date. Okay. It's uh, publicly listed. Uh, so, yeah, you guys want to know where I live? Great, go look it up. KB1TNF. It's required by law that I have a valid mailing address. And I just got too damn lazy to maintain a post office box. And it was, quite honestly, as expensive. So, yeah, you want to know where I live? Great. Yay, long live privacy. <laughs> That's why I make it my ex voice sounds. Yep. Wow. No comment. Uh, in any case, um, we're, so we're not here to get all preachy on you. Oh my god, you guys need to go get your ham radio license. It would be a really good idea, but we want to educate. You look like this guy. Yeah. yeah. That guy. <laughs> that guy. That guy. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to let you guys know about the, the technology that can, can enable you. Okay, um, so basically once you've gotten your ham radio license, the, you have so many more options at this point. Um, we, we've got some options for us to have some additional powerful types of communications. Uh, a lot of the ham radio folks are th thoroughly entrenched in the emergency communications fields, um, you know, gaining access to, to weather information and doing weather spotting and, and helping communications into areas that are affected by disaster. So you're already starting to meet folks that are like-minded by getting involved in the community. Okay, um, and it can be expensive and or complicated as you're willing to make it, or it can be really simple. Okay, um, but with great power, and we'll see a little bit more about power, comes great responsibility. Okay, so here's the deal. We've got the FCC. We want to use some of these uh, ham radio bands with specific power requirements. We have to obey by their rules. Okay, or if we're not here in the U.S., the other governmental agency that, that works there. Um, that's great. These rules now sort of set the understanding for how these things operate, how we can use them effectively, what we can do with them, but they've got some rules. We're not allowed to do encrypted communications of various types. Uh, if we secure the message but not the transmission method, there's some leeway there. Um, so they don't like to see encrypted communications. Well. That kind of sucks. But uh, what happens when that government agency no longer exists or has no ability to enforce? Great. The FCC is going to start enforcing laws based on radio stuff after an EMP? I don't think so. Okay. So great. Let's practice now, learn how to use all of our stuff, and then when there's no more FCC, to heck with them. We do what we want. Okay. Okay, so let's think about uh, the application now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some equipment that we may want to start thinking about from a ham radio perspective. Um, great, this is the part that can get expensive as you want it to. Uh, but again, think swap meets, eBay, and Craigslist. Uh, all of my stuff is from these places. Um, and, and new is not always better because you know what? They've got more buttons and more functions for you guys to figure out and more buttons to break off. Two is one, one is none. Functions to fix. 
and functions to fail. Um, and, and quite honestly, in the, the height of a disaster, do you want to really sit down and try to read the manual and figure it out? If you can push a, push a button and turn it on and make it work, great. Doesn't need to be terribly commu uh, complicated. Okay. Um, two is one, one is none. If you've got one stored off somewhere or both of them stored off, make sure you take them out and use them. Make sure they continue to work. Okay. Uh, and don't discount what the ham radio uh, community efficiently, uh, um, uh, affectionately calls boat anchors. Uh, these are like 19 inch rack mount gears and some of these old Halicrafters type uh, uh, transceivers that are literally boat, boat anchors because when they don't work you can tie a chain to them and anchor a boat with it. They're like 30 and 40 pounds a piece. Uh, oftentimes they use some antiquated technology around tubes, but guess what's EMP proof? Vacuum tubes. Just make sure you stock up on spare tubes, okay? Um, so yeah, the, the don't discount the boat anchors, and you know this stuff is actually really cool in some of the history of the the, uh, the radio communications industry, okay? Um, and, and beware when you're looking at some of this older stuff that if you're going to start potentially using this for some digital communications, um, beware what they were originally intended for, uh, and, and maybe not the duty cycle for the constant communication, uh, and, and give them a break from time to time. All right, great, a little bit more gear. This is not my car, um, but from what I read, but what from what I read about the story that it's about a $500 car with $25,000 worth of radio gear in it. Great, so more radios equals more toys, and I already said that we liked gadgets, right? So this is a good thing, okay? So more radios equals more toys. The problem is, great, we want communication with somebody else, they've gotta have toys too. Okay, so time to make friends or buy more toys, $25,000 in your car, and you can start handing them out on the street corners. Okay, um, and, and you know, think about making friends in the community uh, and, and in your local area for some of these tactical uh, sort of long distance communications. Okay, so we now potentially wanting to enable communications from more stations, we're now potentially talking about more radios and more of all the accessories. Okay, um, we're looking to, to have you guys think about building some community, maybe over at our website, survivalnerds.com or uh, ARRL, the Amateur Radio Relay League. Uh, and believe it or not, LinkedIn has a very active ham radio and emergency communications uh, community. Okay. All right, so don't forget uh, all the extra parts and some of our other commodity gear as well. Okay, and start stocking up now. So, uh Again, more practice. Uh, having the gear is great, but again, if you don't know how to use it, then you're going to be lost when it when it uh, when it goes down. Uh, again, this you know the simple stuff. So this is just a handheld uh, uh, transceiver. This is the only piece of ham radio equipment that I have. This was uh, just a shade over a hundred dollars. Brand new. Uh, brand new. Uh, it's a company uh, Whoopson. It's cheap Chinese stuff, but it works, uh, and it's cheap. And that's all I have. Or you can get the really expensive 5,000 buttons, 5,000 functions, um, but you don't need that. This work, this would work just fine in, uh, in the event of emergency. I can link up to a repeater and talk to lots of other people. Yep. Um, so again, know, know how your equipment uh, works so that we are not frantically trying to read the email or the manual as uh, something is happening. And um, be sure to rotate your gear. So if you've got gear that's been sitting around for 20 years and hasn't been touched, probably you it may not work when you go to plug it in. Um, it's been it's been sitting too long. So uh, rotate your gear and uh, know how to use it. Yep. And some of the others too. Uh, great. We want to start talking about digital modes and transferring you know byte bits and bytes. Uh, great. We need to have a little bit of extra communications gear and we need to know how to hook it up and how to use it. Uh, and some great options here. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the local ham radio clubs uh, utilizing my solar panel and batteries. Uh, for field day, so the concept of taking your ham radio out into a field with uh, emergency power and enabling communications for emergencies. Okay. Great, uh, we're gonna skip ahead on this one, but great, protect your gear, great, go build yourself a cabinet. And uh, great, Larry, you've, Darren, you've talked to us about all this gear and what we can do with it, but where are the freaking tubes? We want our porn. Okay, so we've talked to you about ham radio technology, we've talked about some gear, we've talked about some survival goodies and power and all this type of stuff, but how the heck does this help me rebuild the internet? Okay, let's start figuring out how we can potentially use this stuff to start doing data transfers. First up, 
The computer. I'm beginning to think you wish you lived in the 70s. Yeah, I did, actually. But none of the computer operators ever looked like this. So. Sure they did. Sure they did? They don't look like that now. No, because on the internet, the men are men. The women are men, and the children are FBI agents waiting to get you. Right, right. <laughs> All right, so great. Now I use it to surf the tube, the use this computer to surf the tubes that don't exist. Thank you, sir. Great. So how about using it to surf the new tubes? Uh, but more importantly, how about we use it to start controlling hardware to enable data communication? So make this a dual purpose device, doing more with less. Okay. Um, so let's do some ham radio rig control. Let's connect our ham radio to our computer and control it that way and use it to uh, enable the audio tones for us to do digital transfers. Great, really simple to do, very inexpensive to do as well. Okay, Think back to the days of the old external modems, and that's essentially what we're turning the computer into over ham radio. Okay, So again, sending that data with the modem analogy. Yep, nice 300 baud Apple modem here with the external coupler. Great, so we need to t convert the data coming from our computer to tones that we can transmit over a, uh, an audio-based interface on our ham radio. Um, same thing with the modem and some of the same issues apply. Interfacing and audio bandwidth uh, as well as potential fidelity and distance. Okay, So now we'll get into uh, a couple of the digital modes and their applications. So one of the first ones that will come up would be uh, carrier wave. Uh, this is just good old Morse code. It can go a very, very long distance and a very, very narrow bandwidth. And yes, a digital mode on off. Yep. Uh, you know, you get your good old dots and dashes, um, and we could use this to to possibly transfer data. Obviously, there's some limitations to it. If you don't have a computer uh, driving the the uh, CW code, doing it manually, a really good CW code can do about 20 words per minute, which is about 16.5 baud. Yeah, that's not a typo. 16.5 baud. Pretty sure that's really slow. Um, <laughs> then there's some. Uh, uh, obvious limitations that there's uh, certain character sets that are missing out of the CW uh, code. So if we want to encrypt or encode our communications, we're going to have a harder time doing that with existing uh, like a UU encode or XORing or Base64. We're just missing some character sets that aren't there. But? But it's cheap. It's easy to do. Um, again, the equipment to do it is really, really cheap and it's really, really free, uh, easy. and. Um, again, can go very long distance over a very short amount of, a very little amount of power. Yep, so for example, this uh, picture on the right is a uh, tuna fish can uh, uh, CW transceiver. Um, so it's a, a radio built in a tuna fish can and it's five watts. And they can do DX with that as in from the US to foreign countries, five watts in a tuna can. Cool, and we can send technically ones and zeros with this. Okay, uh, PSK31. Uh, another uh, digital mode, it's a little bit newer from, from Morse code, uh, was invented about 1998, um, and it doesn't have the traditional doo -doo 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 -doo. it's got a, a, a whistle with sort of a light warble, um, and, and is great for sort of low bandwidth requirements. Uh, again, sort of using the rig control with our ham radio and our computer, all we do is read and type, and it does all of the stuff for us. The problem is it's also really freaking slow. It's called PSK31 for a reason because it's 31 baud. Not 3100 baud, not 310 baud, 31 baud. Okay. Uh, there's also no error control or correction. And uh, mapping ASCII to this is interesting because it has some uh, unusual uh, byte encodings. Okay. But we use the full 128 character ASCII set. So if we want to do base 64 for taking binaries and do base 64 encoding, Great, we can do UU encoding. We've got the full character set there. Um, the problem is, is there's no error correction, so starting to do large blocks, we're going to potentially uh, introduce lots of errors here. Okay. Um, now the problem is, is we also run into some issues with the FCC and some of this encoded transmissions. So let's think about how we can do this now, even though it would potentially break FCC laws, uh, regulations. Don't do it, um, but think about how we can. And, and again, with PSK31, we're very similar to Morse code. We can, again, do long distance communications with as little as five watts. Okay, and it's very resistant to poor uh, radio communications uh, stuff. Okay, and uh, lots of, you don't need a lot of gear to do this. Um, we're uh, looking at low power CPU, sound card, cables, and a resistor to enable the uh, ham radio to be keyed with the device. Um, I'm attempting to set this up with a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, let's do PSK31 to the Raspi. Okay. 
Yeah. Small device, portable, low power requirement? Sure. Getting there. Getting there. We were hoping we could do it and show you one here, but not so much. All right. Next one up, uh, WinLink 2000. Uh, great. You want to do email with attachments? Awesome. Install WinLink 2000 on your machine attached to your uh, ham radio gear. Uh, and it's really sort of uh, developed and intended for, quote, remote internet. Okay. Have another station that's connected to the internet. And you can deliver email with attachments to places that don't have internet, like boats um, and remote residences. Okay. Uh, based on uh, AX25, and we've got some other potential options for us here, uh, not s some of the other uh, ham radio modes, including D-Star. And we can do WinLink over Wi-Fi. Okay. We can cover some potentially long distances with some of the ham radio stuff. We've talked a little bit that. Uh, and we have the ability to do store and forward communications. Great. The other end doesn't necessarily have to be on, and it will uh, potentially do multiple hops and can store that until we're ready for us. Okay. And it's based on a client server architecture. Right now, if you want to get into WinLink 2000, you become a client, and the server stuff is relatively expensive to set up. Um, and they want you to have it connected 365, uh, you know, 24-7, 365. But we can do WinLink in peer-to-peer -peer mode. So if we want to exchange some data, great, get on your radio and tell your, your buddy down the street that you're going to send him some data. You fire up, he fires up his server. You fire up your client. You send him the data, and you're, you're done. Or you have a schedule. Okay? Uh, we don't even need to have it connected to the Internet. Yeah, just two stations sending to each other. Okay. Um, the military actually uses this with the Mars program. Uh, as, so uh, there's some experience. A lot of people that might actually be around after one of these disasters might know how to use it. And uh, maybe you can uh, leverage uh, those folks. Okay. Um, it, it does use a proprietary protocol, um, or could use a proprietary protocol, um, but it does require some expensive stuff on either end um, uh, based around some of the other WinLink stuff. Instead, we can now potentially go down another route. So the other row, we have your uh, packet radio. So now we're talking about some speeds that may actually be halfway decent, still pretty limited. Um, but the gear for it is really, really expensive. Um, takes a, it's not easy to set up, and, uh, but, and we can do better. Yep. And here's how we think we can do better. Okay. Let's use some commodity gear, right? Okay. This is relevant to my interests. Okay, my good friend Paul Asadorian and I co-wrote the uh, Linksys Ultimate 54G hacking book from Singris. Okay, let's go leverage those pieces of hardware uh, and enable some uh, Wi-Fi with some uh, antennas and some amplifiers and and get some longer distance communications gear out of Wi-Fi stuff. And guess what? It's all IP enabled. Okay, and this is stuff that you guys probably all understand. Okay, so based on that, one of the projects that uh, we've been looking at uh, is the uh, high-speed multimedia network HSM Mesh. Um, this has got a lot of development uh, in the Austin area. Uh, they actually have a mesh, large mesh network set up in Austin for doing IP communications, and they use it for emergency communications in support of, of some of the medical facilities. Okay, uh, and it's a uh, custom firmware for uh, the Linksys WRT 54G based on Kamikaze 709. Okay, uh, and it's a fully self-healing, self-routing mesh network. Um, you power it up, you install the firmware, you give it a small config, and it works. And it auto joins the mesh, and you're off. Easy. I mean, literally, I set a mesh network up in my living room in about 15 minutes. Great, it was in my living room, right? Yeah, doesn't do very well. Okay, um, we can now use these devices. So I can take my laptop and plug it into the Linksys WRT54G to local resources with wired cable. Okay, short cable. Okay, and uh, all the rules of the internet now apply here because it's all IP-based traffic. All right. So a little bit more about the Wi-Fi portion of this stuff. Okay, uh, HSM Mesh shows up with uh, with that SSID for HSM Mesh. Uh, and it's an ad hoc network, and you can observe it with something like Wireshark. That's how I learned about the project. I found it on a pen test. Okay. Um, the interesting thing is if you can detect that there's one there, and you set up your own mesh wireless network based on the HSM mesh uh, stuff, if you make sure that the SID, SSID is the same, it will automatically join that network. No authentication. Okay. Woohoo! That might be advantageous or not. Okay. Uh, and the basis is uh, OSLR for some of the mesh routing, so readily available stuff. 
Okay. Um, but you're saying to me, Larry, this is good and all, but you can only do per FCC regulations one watt indoors and four watts outdoors. Okay, we'll get to that. So great, install them outdoors, right? And then we can do a full four watts. Okay, so this is sort of why we were mentioning about the weatherproofing. Um, and now we may want to find some additional antennas. Okay, and allegedly, according to the FCC, we can do WEP or WPA in some of these, but it takes a little bit of tinkering with the firmware to make it happen. Okay. All right. I mentioned before that with great power comes great responsibility. Well, getting your ham radio license also gives you great responsibility and great power. Okay. So as a licensed ham radio operator, uh, you have the option to use up to 1,500 watts in certain scenarios. No longer this four watt thing, right? So uh, more power, okay? Great. So uh, all you need to be able to do this is get your technician license. What, a week's worth of study? and you too can use 1,500 watts of power, okay? Um, so some of the channels for uh, commodity gear fall within uh, the ham radio amateur band uh, allocations. So if we look at 802.11b channels one through six, uh, direct sequence spread spectrum, we can use 10 watts on channels one through six. That's more than four, okay? 10 is greater than four. Uh, if we look at all of the 802.11g channels, we can use up to 1,500 watts. Why? Because the FCC regulations only apply to direct sequence spread spectrum technology, and G and, uh, uh, G and A are uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, not subject to those same FCC regulations for limits on power. So great, go install your G network with 1,500 watts. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, you want to talk about uh, distance, even at 802.11b with 10 watts, um, the, the folks in Austin have done up to 10 miles in urban areas, okay, that's pretty damn good, uh, and 79 to 134 miles with clear line of sight in, in the country, great. So get your towers ready and get your masks on your roof, and uh, now do that for 802.11g with 1500 watts, okay, all sorts of winning. That will definitely get us to the end of the block, okay? Great, so now in order to enable this, we need all sorts of stuff. So some of the things that we need, you know, use the commodity gear, you got your, uh, your routers, get some, get some good uh, directional antennas. Um, again, have all this stuff on hand ready to go because you don't want to be searching for this stuff house by house after. It's a good way to get shot. Um, and how many of your neighbors have really big Wi-Fi antennas and amplifiers? Probably none, um, but it's still, it's still a good way to get shot, just going outdoors. Um, again, uh, you got to find something, too, that was protected. If, it, you know, if we're in an EMP situation, you may find a lot of this stuff, and it's already fried. Um, so it's good to have it on hand uh, ahead of time. Luckily, Larry wrote the book, so he's got like 50,000 of those stupid little routers <laughs> in his basement. So some more extras. Uh, so you, you want to pick up, so, you know, have some laptops handy. You know, they've gotten really cheap lately um, and really powerful uh, for what you want to do. I mean, if you're just sending, you know, we're looking at using something like a Raspberry Pi to do the, uh, the, the packet wave stuff. You don't need something very, 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 very powerful, but, you know, they have gotten cheaper and more powerful. Um, so have some of those on hand. You know, get, get, some, uh, get some small netbooks because they're portable, they're light, um, and they do have a lot of power. Yeah. My, my entire ham radio station runs on two netbooks, uh, three uh, transceivers, and all runs off of solar. Okay. Um, some of the other ones, too, is that, uh, you know, if you're going to be enabling multiple stations, um, this could get expensive, but this is where community comes in. Okay. Um, and great. You need software to make some of this happen. You need some sort of rig control software to run on your, your netbook to control your radio to enable digital transfers. Uh, great, you need to have the software because what happens when your hard drive dies? Yeah, make sure you've got a copy of Windows and make sure you need every potential dependency to reinstall that software because what happens when you need to reinstall your rig control software and you need .NET framework? Oh, I'll just connect to the, oh, wait, I can't connect to the internet to go download it, right? So you better make sure you have a copy. Okay, uh, and remember, um, you need all of the dependencies to make that happen. Okay. Um, then back it up twice, and then do it six more times. Okay, because this is going to be your only copy. This is going to be it. Okay, so 
find ways to make your backups after the crash because then you're going to start going through your backups and they're going to get destroyed. So uh, yeah, great, back them up to spinning disk. And then what happens six months down the road when those spinning disks fail, even though they were stored in your EMP cabinet? Because that stuff breaks, right? Great. Um, good. Have copies on DVDs. And then if you've ever gotten kids' movies from Netflix, what happens with those? The other parents let them throw those things around like Frisbees, and they're all scratched to hell. You know, you drop it, you put it on your desk once, and you scratch it, and then it's unusable. You will burn multiple copies. And think about thumb drives and flash drives as well. But uh, great, you drop one, you step on it, um, it doesn't work, you accidentally leave it through in your pocket and uh, it, it goes through the washboard and the laundry, um, or, or it just fails, or you forget to put it in the damn EMP cabinet and you get another EMP strike. There you go, all over. So now we've talked about all this stuff, now it's time to, to develop a plan. So while, while this is... Uh, all, uh, all good and everything, without a plan, a lot of this is useless. You have to know what you're gonna do in the scenario when it happens. Again, you don't have to say, okay, government collapse is gonna happen, so I need to be prepared for that, or um, I'm worried about the Mayan calendar coming, uh, coming up in December, which is crap, and, uh, and uh, or, uh, um, or, you know, complete financial, because, you know, we're too big to fail, right? So, um, you know, have a plan for when, when you do have a local disaster, forest fire, or something of that, of that nature, and uh, what you're going to do. So start acquiring some licenses now, and, uh, and, and uh, some practice, and get some of this gear together. Start seeing what uh, other people, like-minded people, might be in your community for this stuff. Again, you know, everyone you think, oh, preppers, they're kind of crazy, right? All there are about guns and, uh, and food storage. No, you don't have to be crazy like that. Um, you can do it quite, quite sanely, and uh, you just don't want to be a burden on, um, on, uh, on emergency services that may not even show up. At least, yeah, at least at a start. So, yeah, and, and the big thing is, great, go get the stuff now. Figure out how to use it now. Go get your license so you can practice with this stuff, because it's, after it happens, it's probably going to be too late. Okay. So, and the other ones too, uh, you know, think about